Programming Throwdown, episode 100, 100th episode. Take it away, Patrick. Well, it is April of 2020, and the whole world is experiencing COVID-19. Yep. Uh, so we're going to have a celebration of our 100th episode. We're going to try not to, to dwell too much on it. Uh, we have some work from home stuff we might talk about in another episode or two and some tips and tricks we've learned. Uh, but uh, this week, we want to use our intro topic to complain about how terrible all video conferencing is. Now that we're all oh stuck dealing gosh. with it all the time, video conferencing is is hard. I get it. But man, it, it's just brutal, the latency. And for me, I never knew until this, uh, you know, we talked about to various guests who work remotely and talking about working remotely. Uh, and when everyone works remotely individually and with the current latency and everything, what I underestimated is how hard it is to read a room. So how much I rely on like saying something and looking at people and understanding, are they hearing what I'm saying? Is it interesting? Do I need to like explain it because they look confused? And I just have given up on that. It's, it's like doing the <laughs> podcast. It's just talking to an empty audience and hoping that at the end they'll ask questions. Yeah, exactly. The latency for me is such a killer. And I, I feel like it's something that could be solved so easily. I mean, basically, you know, I think the actual true latency, like if I want to send a packet to any one of the people on the call, that that should be much less than a second. Um, so so it's really just that there's buffering and you know they want it to feel natural and not stutter and everything, which that makes sense. But then at least give us something where we can like, like I could press the space bar and my face would just glow so people know that I have something to say. And then, <laughs> and then maybe like, you know, you, you when someone's talking, the person who wants to talk next could just press the space bar. And if like two people do it at the same time, it would just randomly pick one. Um, but instead mm -hmm. what you have is, you know, somebody talks and then they never really know if someone else has anything to say. So they keep talking. Finally, they stop, and then there's this pause, and everyone interrupts each other at the same time. Yeah, so. some of that I feel like cultural and etiquette are going to evolve. I, I I think this might be one of those things we look back on, depending on how all this lasts, and, and laugh about how bad it was in the beginning. And I think maybe we kind of devise some etiquette for how to do stuff. So, like, what is appropriate or inappropriate? How do you, like, like you said, like, did you raise your hand, and someone is, like, the the shell holder and they pass the shell to the next person. Uh, and you know, they, they're the ones who get to speak. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think we can make it better, but for now, ugh, Oh, not good. Yep. Yep. It's just a painful period. Um, but I, I think actually one thing that, that really impressed me is, um, is, is, is the, the, the fact that like you could have 20, 30, even 40 people in a call. Um, you know, we use this software called blue jeans, uh, where I work, um, um, I think it might only be for enterprise. I don't know if like anyone can just go on blue jeans. I'm actually gonna look this up now. Um, yeah, I think it, oh no, I think, well, no, it has a trial. Yeah. So it's basically for enterprise. It costs money, but, um, um, but it's, it's amazing how many people can go in one call that, that part really impressed me. So I actually feel like the technology, um, you know, given the, 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 the way the media is, the technology is pretty good probably as good as it could get but it's just that you know the, just the limitations um require us to communicate a little differently and we just haven't figured that out yet i mean what, what's your take do you think that the tech itself is bad or just that we haven't figured out how to use it i think both so i think the well that's it i guess a cop-out answer so i mean i think the <laughs> tech the latency is tough but i think we've also just not adjust adjusted to the the sort of norms for it and doing these big group like running things the same way they used to run so we continue to run online meetings like we used to run in-person meetings. And I think maybe that's just not the right way. I don't know what the right way is, but maybe that's not the right way. So even just the UI. So we've had large meetings similarly with our software with 20, 30 people. But then like it won't fit all of the faces on the screen at the same time. Like how do you choose who to display? I, I don't think the sort of invent the way we always use it before is like one room connecting to another room or one person dialing into a meeting. We've never had a you know, 20, 30 person meeting where everyone's in their own room. And so it is actually, as you said, somewhat impressive that it works at all with that many people and getting all of the video streams into one place, processing them and sending them out back to everyone. I mean, that is not an easy problem. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I, I, the latency is 
is is something that I don't think it can really be solved if you're sending video, especially at that quality. But yeah, it just needs to be handled better so that um, so that people can communicate without cutting each other off. Mm. Need, I, maybe another way of putting it is I feel like the technology is good, but the product isn't good. Maybe that's a that's a better way to. Say it. But I would say maybe the product isn't wasn't built with this use case in mind. Like it's uh, it's the most adjacent thing, but it wasn't. Yeah. At least how we're using it, it's not the most adjacent. You're totally right. Or it's right. not the, it's not the, it's not, it wasn't designed for that use case. Yep, yep. Yeah, and then all like of those needs people, to make a new product. Yeah. And all of those people are working from home using their own product, trying to build the fixes. So they also are struggling, right? They're all like, no, our <laughs> yeah, person exactly. team, this is not working well. So I'm sure it's a pain point for them and they're probably trying to fix it, but it'll take time for them too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it. Yeah, I wonder, you know, I don't know if even being uh, uh, the leader right now is even an advantage because because things like WebRTC are standards. So anyone can make a WebRTC app. I'm sure there's a lot of complexity around the details there. But but uh, if someone comes up with a, a new way for, you know, 10 people to, you know, all talk with each other uh, without constantly interrupting each other, I think they could easily disrupt uh Whoever's in, in, at the top right now, I guess maybe Zoom is at the top. I don't know. They seem to be the most one in the press. So I know I mean, they're constantly in the press, I, I, and and some of the things are pretty wild. I don't know how true they are. There's something like all of the um, um, all of the information is going to like a server offshore or something. I don't know. There's a lot of weird stories about Zoom. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the uh, classic engineering trope to say that uh, I understand one thing, I understand all the things. So this can't be that hard. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, you're right. Maybe an opportunity for someone, someone new in the space to come in and uh, to take advantage of all this. I don't know. I guess we'll wait yeah. and see. Although the internet pipes are might might just fall over. Uh, I know. Yeah. From, for are me, they at least, still you know, uh, are they still doing standard def for uh, for for YouTube and and uh, all the video streaming Netflix? Yeah, I think I think a lot of them are rolling it out. Just they're crumbling under the. 300, 400, 500 percent increase in in utilization. I think YouTube, it's the they change the default down, but you can still bump it back up uh, oh, if I you see. if you elect to. Got it. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's just completely unexpected um, to have something like a uh, 300 percent increase in in usage for something like YouTube. It's unbelievable. So right. for for news and our sites of the month. Sites of the month. I like that. Uh, oh, I just made that up right now. Um, <laughs> so. So my first one is I did not know about this before. And then, you know, people publishing this like, you know, now that you and we should we should give a shout out. You know, if you've if you've been furloughed or lost your job, you know, my heart goes out to you because, yeah, I think that's happening to a lot of people. I'm very fortunate it hasn't happened to me, um, you know, but I know that's a lot of people. um, So complaining about work from home is a little bit of a privileged stance, I guess, because um, it's good to actually be able to work. Um, so if you haven't been, you know, apologies, shout outs. I know students, students are struggling right now. Um, a lot of part time yep. work has, has disappeared. So so my heart goes out to you. Uh, if you do have free time, though, or, you know, you're just stuck inside because you're under a shelter in place somewhere in this uh, wonderful world. Uh, this site, I didn't know that this even existed before. Uh, and now that it did, I'm I'm got it open and I'm uh, starting to, to kind of do this. And that's uh, learn.unity.com. And this is sort of the Unity platform, which we've, I think we had a whole episode about. Um, their website for learning how to program and use Unity. And they've made these uh, these teaching sessions free for, for three months. And they have projects like a first person shooter or a, uh, like a go-kart game where you can go in and make modifications, small changes, learn how it works. And I think that's really cool. For me, starting from scratch or even with just a game engine or something like Unity and building up a whole project is pretty intimidating. But I definitely could go in and change some of the assets for a first person shooter or the physics or change it into, you know, adding up some HUD or something. And they have a number of tutorials here that are, are free, at least for the next three months. Um, I wasn't ever, I wasn't able to find out how much it costs normally. It didn't look that hard. But for the next three months, at least, this is a cool thing to be able to do. So if you've ever had an interest in sort of playing around in game programming, I, I would take advantage of this. I'm planning to get download some of these projects and sort of goof around with them myself. I think for my kids, it would be a good opportunity. Yeah, they're probably not going to use this to learn to program. They're still a little bit young. 
but have them tell me what they would like to see and be able to do it for them and be the kind of uh, hero in their eyes, at least, which I guess is a kind of a low bar, but, you know, <laughs> be able to do something specific. I want a pumpkin. Oh, sure. Here, let's let's make a pumpkin. And then they can have a game that they they helped build. Yeah, this is awesome. I'm taking a look at it now. Um, yeah, there's a ton of really good resources here. Uh, Unity is definitely um, sort of taking over as 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 the game engine now. And the thing about game engines is kind of like it's kind of like um, it's kind of like you know how how you have those web apps that they make for the phone, and and the things don't quite feel right. So so because it's it's HTML and JavaScript, but they're trying to make it feel like the iPhone UI. You know the, the slider doesn't quite move right. There's just not as much there's not as much inertia on the slider. It's just because uncanny valley. I think that Unity is getting such a market share that that everyone else is getting kind of put into that uncanny valley. Where now, if like if I play a game that isn't on the Unity engine, it just there's just weird. It just doesn't it just doesn't behave like everything else. And so it's 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 if you're interested in doing games, and they might even get into um, other sort of you know visual if you have to do maybe interactive charts or something might might become a thing in unity so i think it's a definitely a good thing to learn it looks like the after the three months it costs 15 dollars a month which uh you know seems very reasonable um if you're if you're using it um you're getting a lot of content out of it so um cool my thing of the show is uh dig.ccmixter.org um, so CC Mixer is a site that has a ton of different um, audio um, resources. And dig.cc Mixer is a bunch of free resources. So if you're making a YouTube video, if you're making a, a video game in Unity, if you want to take the background music that came with the, uh, with the Unity uh, uh, you know, starter pack and replace it with something else, um, you can just go and grab uh, any of these uh, um, uh, music uh, um, songs and you can put them anywhere um, you know as long as some of them are um, attribution licensed so you know in the credits of your game or your video um, you, or, or in the comments uh, the description of your video you have to give them a shout out um, I mean, which you should be doing anyways um, but other than that they're totally free to use and there's a there's a ton of content they just hit their 1 million mark or 1 million uh, folks have used uh, a, 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 at least one song from there which is pretty incredible and uh, you know it's it's a great resource I love things like this and free sound and and other sort of sites that that have tons of media for you to use uh, you know for your own projects that's pretty cool I, I guess that t- dovetails in with the uh, the previous suggestions when you make your game and you uh, want some cool music and uh, you can yeah man we yeah, got a theme exactly going. yeah so yeah, to break exactly. By the end of this, you know, if you are furloughed, which you know, again, you know, heart goes out to y'all, but but uh, um, you know, you could use some of that time to make a make a pretty cool first person shooter, learn some new tech. So n- not building on the previous two, I have something completely <laughs> different, which is physicstravelguide.com, and uh, I've always had this sort of weird passing interest in physics. I've never been able to get into the rigor of it. You know, I, I studied it in, I, I guess, a little bit in high school and in college. Um, and I never really got into sort of the deep physics or the whatever you know, theoretical physics and those kinds of things. But I found this website pretty good. And, and reading the explanation, it's like something I guess I never knew was missing, which is you get these, uh, which is what I would give. So I won't try to for any of them. You get the sort of like armchair quarterback explanation of physics from your friend, uh, which often leaves some to be desired. You could search whatever you're interested in in Wikipedia and probably be overwhelmed by things you don't understand or complexity, which is what I often find for math and physics. And so this website tries to um, take a variety of topics, allow you to sort of look in whatever you're interested in, uh, and then explains it somewhere in the middle. So it tries to be rigorous, but it gives you sort of an intuitive explanation. So something that just like, oh, okay, I get that that kind of makes sense. Uh, and then they try to give you a sort of more formal and then the fully sort of abstract with formulas and everything. But they also give you a bunch of links to follow up on uh, and all of that. And they've got tons of articles here on just, you know, all sorts of things about quantum mechanics. Here's Maxwell's equation, Schrodinger's equation. And there's brief, very sort of simple to understand high level stuff. Uh, there's, you know, what, what, where to go from there? Like, how does it relate to the rest of physics? 
I found this a really interesting resource. You know, I haven't sat here and read all of it, but I do find every so often I come across some idea and I'm thinking about it. I don't know why. And just wondering, you know, I wonder how that works. Um, and yeah, here's a way to go amazing. look it up. Yeah, there's so much good content here. There's also just looking at it. I'm like, I have no idea what that is and like click it. And then I get a, oh, okay. Well, at least now I, I didn't know I knew that before, but uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, this is awesome. Yeah, I mean, I could easily, uh, I know what I'm doing today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this well, covers everything. Yeah, so things like magnetic monopoles uh, and do they exist? Why would they be important if they don't exist or do exist? And yeah, it's cool stuff. Yeah, so I mean, check it out. This, they have this whole equation magnetic. section where they talk about um, um, all these different ways of solving problems. The Physics? Einstein equation. Physics is one of those things that has sort of puzzled me when I when I think about it. It seems like throughout my career, various physics things have always come up, like topics just from the news or from someone's idle thoughts, and we'll bring it up in the office, which is one of the things I don't think comes up as much anymore. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things that is a recurring theme where I don't need to know any physics to be able to do my job whatsoever, presently. Um, but it's something that I find that people who tend to do programming and stuff and be into it. And like me also have a, a sort of passing interest. So I guess there's some similarity there. Uh, and it's one of those kind of quirky things that I, I guess there's no real reason why uh, they need to be related, but I find that they often are. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I mean, I think the, the um, at, at the end of the day, the physics is kind of like uh, what people, uh, what computer scientists did before there were computer scientists, right? So, I mean, a lot of us like to, um, like to build stuff and simulate things and and now it's 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 you know now we can work sort of in the world of bits but before when there was only the world of atoms um you know i think that that it's sort of natural it's kind of a natural progression so for my for our next link this is something i came across which has been on my list of i would one day like to learn more about which is the sort of rigorous formal computer science uh theorem proving and we, I don't, I'm sure we've probably talked about uh, various of languages used for this one before. One is C O Q. Is that Coke or Cock? I don't know. Um, but oh, yeah. another one is the Lean Theorem Prover. And uh, I, as soon as I try reading it, I instantly kind of nope my way out. Um, well, I think we've talked about Agda before too, and I think Agda is pretty similar. Um, uh, maybe not. I don't know. See, I don't even know enough about this to know. Yeah, this but is did... wild. What What is this? <laughs> <laughs> so, so this lean theorem prover is one of these things where you try to take a theorem and through a series of, I guess you would call them transformations. I don't know. I, I need to kind of go all the way through it. Again, it's it's on my maybe bucket list is too strong, but it's on my list of things to one day learn about. Is to sort of take a set of transformations and prove. Uh, a statement. So you might say that like the inverse of an inverse of a value is equal to the value itself, right? Um, okay. So you say like if I invert a value and invert it back, it's itself. So like, but why? How? Like, how do you prove that? Like, what is the sequence of steps to go through to explain oh, that? See. Or or the you know rule of what is it commutivity or associative rule? Like these rules in mathematics. Like, how do you say that a plus b is equal to b plus a? Like how do we know that that's universally true? How would you prove to a computer that this is uh, something that it should take for granted? Um, you know, as a human, oh, we know we trust other people have done it. But if you have a computer which has a set of, I guess, a language for describing what things are true at a base level, and you prove enough of those base level things and, and link them to each other in a certain way, the computer can go, yes, you have shown that this must be true now. Oh, I see. So, so uh, this natural so this, number. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this graph is is doing is is trying to do that. You're saying. So this, yeah. So this natural number game, which is my link, we'll link it in the show notes. Uh, presently, it's it's uh, I think getting it was for some reason having some hiccups. It wasn't working so great for me. Has a sequence of things to go through, teaching you, uh, I guess, a variant of the lean theorem prover, which is one of the tools people use to do this kind of work by uh, taking you through the steps of getting through sort of proving addition and how addition works and why it works. Um, and going to, like I was saying, like that the, I always forget the rules, so is it associativity and commutivity? Uh, yeah, and they right. have a sequence of learning steps laid out in a graph of one way 
you might go through the dependencies and build upon each other and your understanding while also teaching you how to do this theorem proving. Um, and I thought it was a pretty cool approach for something that I've long wanted to understand. Uh, and uh, maybe this is helpful to you if you've also wanted to learn about theorem proving. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, I've never been, uh, you know, into into theorem proving, but uh, my my PhD advisor, he's famous for saying uh, theory is worthless. <laughs> that's like his thing. Um, you know, I think that that obviously that's like a really extreme view. I mean, it's something that only someone who is a professor in neural networks would say. Um, but but I think that you know it's 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 um, um, but I think that you know without without it you can't you can't really get started. I think a lot of the stuff that we take for granted, as you said, is because some people like like took something that we kind of observed and we were able to construct a pattern and generalize it. Yeah, this is totally awesome. And it actually has a really nice tutorial and it walks you through um, like starting with the identity, like proving that X equals X. And then, uh, or I guess at that point, that's an observation. Yeah, this is cool. Man, between this and the last thing, uh, that's basically going to be my entire day now. It's awesome. <laughs> Hey guys, we're going to take a little break to talk about University of California, Irvine's Division of Continuing Education. So this is a pretty cool program. They have a variety of different um, you know, kind of certificates that you could acquire. They have things like Python, they have data science, they have machine learning. And these are things where, you know, if you didn't necessarily get, let's say, a degree in machine learning or you haven't worked in a, in a, in a, as a machine learning engineer for a bunch of years, um, this is a way to sort of get a lot of that knowledge, a lot of that expertise. And, you know, I know Patrick and I, we've both done a bunch of courses online. Um, um, and, and so it's, it's, it's a really good way to sort of boost, um, you know, your knowledge and your skills in a particular area. Yeah. I mean, I did tons of online classes uh, when I first started working and, um, you know, for me, being part of a class, I mean, it's it's always interesting. But the curriculum, the the self-paced stuff, it works great um, sometimes. But sometimes having a here's what we're doing each week, marching through their curriculum and, and going through it, it's uh, very similar to how a you know just a normal university class works. In fact, you know, feeling like it's almost exactly the same uh, is just a comfortable thing, a good way to learn. Uh, and learning from professors who you know that's that's their thing. That's they teach, they help others to learn, and having access to it, doing the assignments. Uh, it, it really helped me uh, go from, you know, where my undergraduate left off to, you know, to just kind of bootstrapping into more specifics, higher level things, uh, things that were more pertinent to my job at the time. I, you know, I, I hardly recommend people uh, taking classes, continuing education from a from a college. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I think getting it through a university is is actually really, really stellar. I mean, it's really awesome. that Universities are starting to get into this. And um, you, know, you know that there's going to be sort of quality lectures and professors. There's, there's, you know, there's a very strong brand behind any any sort of major university. And you know, UCLA is one of the top universities for CS. So, um, so they, they, you know, they've been around since about 1962, I think. And they, uh, you know, they have, uh, you know, they've been around a long time. They've been doing, you know, they've been teaching a long time. They've been teaching online a long time. And so it's a good place to um, to go and get get this kind of education. Yeah, if you're interested, uh, I think they're still doing enrollment for some late classes for spring, but summer is upcoming. And uh, as we've been talking about this whole episode, I mean, I think everyone has uh, extra time at home these days. Oh, my and gosh. Yeah. If, you, <laughs> if you're interested, you can check it out at ce.uci.edu slash programming throwdown. And uh, we'll put the link in the show notes, of course. Um, but once again, that's ce.uci.edu slash programming throwdown. Yeah. And if you uh, do sign up and take any courses, you know, we'd love to get feedback. You know, please write us in. Tell us what you think of it. Um, you know, we could pass it on to them. But also for us, it's really good to know, um, you know, what you thought about that, uh, you know, folks out there who are listening. So, all right. Back to the show. Uh, now it's time for book of the show. My book of the show is Influence by Robert Cialdini. Um, this is a really interesting book. Um, I actually read it a while back, um, um, but but it kind of stuck with me. And um, it, it goes through the thing I love about this book. So I recommended um, um, 
another book by I think Scott Adams that was about influence. But that book was um, written by someone who I guess felt like they had a lot of influence. This is actually written by a professor who studies influence and studies he's like a social scientist. And so um, they say a lot of, you know, the beginning at least, they say a lot of things that are kind of obvious. Um, but then they show, actually this, this ties in well with, um, with our last news article. Um, they kind of show why these things are what they are. Like they kind of explain the causality there. Um, and then they start jumping into, uh, you know, kind of more advanced topics and things that you wouldn't really expect. Um, one of the things that really stood out for me was um, they said that if you, let's say you're in a traffic accident and so you're on the highway and let's say you have, I don't know, a broken arm or something, you know, someone just hits you from behind, you have a broken arm and let's say that person sped off. So, um, so you're in the, you're in a bad spot, right? So they said, one thing you should do is, is instead of like waving and trying to get all the car's attention at once, you should actually just stop a car or like pick one car and focus on them. Or, or imagine the same thing if you're in a line and, and you're feeling like you're going to pass out or something. Um, you pick one person in the line and you ask them directly for help. And um, the reason why is, is um, basically there's this sort of weird dynamic with influence where if someone isn't totally sure you're trying to influence them or somebody else then then nobody takes you seriously and so um, if you pick one person even if that person doesn't help you by by sort of focusing on them and getting rejected by that person you immediately build like a ton of influence with the people right around them um and and so you know that was just one thing i won't go through everything but it talks a lot about social science it explains like why uh you know car salesmen do what they do um explains you know both good and bad influence um and, and i thought the whole thing was really fascinating i mean i think especially for introverts this is a must read because like you can kind of see uh you know for extroverts and for people who are naturally uh have a lot of influence uh, you know i think um a lot of these things could come naturally or feel naturally um, feel natural, but but uh, for everyone else, uh, you know, just getting the information, being exposed to it, is uh, is extraordinarily valuable. And now you can kind of see. Now that I've read the book, I can kind of see, um, you know, the the attempt to influence in in commercials and in when people write, you know, sales pitches and all of that. You can kind of decompose it, deconstruct it, um, you know, using all of this theory that that's come out of this book. So it's it's a bit of a heavy read. Uh, it's written for lay people like us, so you don't have to be a social scientist. It doesn't use a lot of complicated uh, um, um, terminology, um, but you know it's a pretty deep dive. So so keep that in mind. But you know now is a good time, uh, hopefully for a lot of folks to uh, to do some reading, and I, I think this is a good one to pick up. You've influenced me. I, I feel the need to uh, to read this book about influence. <laughs> All right. Although then so meta. <laughs> so this book must be working. Uh, yeah, it, so. It, yeah. So my uh, my book of the show is a science fiction book called Columbus Day, which is part of a series, Expeditionary Force, by Craig Allenson. Uh, and this, uh, you know, I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy. Since the last time we've done book of the show, I had actually a pretty long list, but I picked this one. It's uh, the most recent one I've read, uh, and I really enjoyed this. Um, it was a pretty lighthearted read. Well, a pretty easy read, not in not a sort of deep deep sci-fi book. But it had some interesting ideas, which is, you know, if the it doesn't spoil too much. I checked the Amazon review and it's listed as sort of the, the summary. But if Earth was invaded by sort of an alien species and then some other alien species came and, you know, did battle with them. And we sort of like, yay, they're our saviors. They fought off the bad guys. We actually have no context for that. We don't know how or why they did what they did to sort of celebrate them at here as heroes makes sense, but could be wrong. Um, oh, and that if if such people actually showed up, we don't know the grand scheme of species and aliens that would be out. So if someone showed up with vastly superior technology to us, we'd somewhat be subservient to them. But if we had a choice, we would have no broader context of the political scheme of where they came from. Like, who are their enemies? Are we allying ourselves with like the really bad people of the universe? And like, are we going to become part of the, you know, axis of evil? Like, we don't. 
you wouldn't really know. And it's sort of an interesting topic that we always think of ourselves as like kind of knowing what's what. And if somebody just, you know, I, you know it's fiction, right? But if someone yeah. sort of just popped into the sky, there would be actually very little we would understand. And what we were able to be communicated about might be very limited. So we may not know the whole story. All you know is that, they, is that they don't like the people who are trying to kill you. <laughs> That's the only piece of information you have, right? Right. But the people trying to kill you, there are various levels of that, right? And so exactly what they, you can always spin it. But then if it gets spun, so they say, you know, you can say, oh, they only were destroying large cities, right? Maybe they were just trying to prevent, uh, you know, make it less, you a less valuable target. Um, and so is that a kind hearted thing to do or a terrible thing to do? Oh, um, were they trying to help you or are they trying to hurt you? So, yes, you're right. So if other people showed up and fought them off, all we know is that they fought them off. Yeah, <laughs> we don't right. know. Are they the bad guys or the good guys? Should we go with them? Should we fight them? Yeah, yeah that's awesome. So this book kind of plays on that theme. Yeah, I've always been curious how people go, and this is probably an enormous tangent, but how, how science fiction writers go about world building. Like, do they usually start with um, something that happened on Earth, like, you know, that they want to to explore and they just want to get rid of basically all the names and the places. Um, but it's really like something that could happen on Earth between countries or or do they do they just start with a blank canvas and say, you know, I want planets made of sodium. And then, then they just start exploring all the implications of that. Yeah, I mean, I think it happens lots of different ways. If you're curious about this, I did stumble across a random Reddit the other day, um, which is the world building Reddit. So oh. uh, if you go to reddit.com slash r slash world building, um, they actually have a Reddit where people give maps for places they've invented. People give feedback, ask questions. What do you think about this? Exactly that. If the world was not mostly silica based sand, but sodium everywhere, like what would be different? Um, and, you know, they kind of riff off each other, help each other think through the implications and generally just, you know, sort of help out creative people with trying to think through what would happen. So, cool subreddit to check out. Yeah, it sounds awesome. It's um, time for, oh, well, talking at first, I was going to skip the middle of the show, <laughs> but I forgot I haven't been driving in the car, but, you know, I still find that, uh, I haven't been actually reading the books either. I found downtime. I've still been listening to, to Audible. And so, uh, Audible, of course, is uh, one of the people who help sponsor our show. And if you go to audibletrial.com slash programming throwdown, uh, you can get uh, your first book free. You could get I don't I didn't check to see if they have influence, but I, that's where I listened to this Columbus Day book. And uh, I don't drive in the commute, but I still find that I use Audible just, you know, the other day I was I think it was vacuuming and I put on headphones and was listening to that while I was vacuuming because um, I guess I'm a weirdo. But um, I, I wanted to keep making progress on my on my books. So if you're interested in checking out listening to books uh, and uh, you haven't yet, you could go to audibletrial.com slash programming throwdown. Get yourself a free book. Also help out the show. Yeah. Yeah. Influence is I, I, I read uh, or listened to Influence on Audible as well. Oh, you and, did? Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, I think I think for me, what I've, my, my routine has been um, basically in the evening. I'll just lay down and and uh, I actually I got these uh, um, I got a new phone I got the Pixel I don't know whatever it is I think I think I got the three it wasn't the very latest one so yeah I got Pixel three it came with um, uh, earbuds and in the past I've I've not liked earbuds they always kind of fall out of the ear or you have the weird hoop around the ear um, but these ones have a really interesting design where basically they shrink wrapped. Uh, like a thick piece of plastic around the beginning of the wire coming out of the earbud. And then they took that wire and they like looped it and put it back, threaded it back through the earbud. And you can actually control the the size of that loop. And that loop actually, you know, presses very gently against like the inside of your ear and kind of keeps it in place. Um, and so for the first time, I feel like I can have earbuds. I can even like run with them and everything. And they're pretty comfortable. Um, so what I've been doing is, is basically laying down, um, and, and you know, that way, if you kind of roll over, you don't, you know, kind of squish like, you know, the, the headphone against your ear and just kind of having some time to like, kind of just close your eyes and, and listen to a book. Um, especially with, um, you know, all of us working from home, you know, we're not, um, 
you know, I just tend, I find myself looking at screens way more um, because I'm either, you know, helping out like uh, the kids and they're they're doing something on a screen or I'm on a screen. And so this is just a, a good opportunity to not have to like read something or really focus your eyes on something. So, yeah. And so you can totally get uh, influence for free if you go to uh, audibletrial.com slash programming throwdown. Also, if you want to support uh, support us and you uh, already have an Audible or you don't want to get an Audible account, you can support us directly on Patreon. Um, also, if you are a member on Patreon, you get the Patreon stream, which is um, has much higher bandwidth. Uh, so that, that part is nice. Um, but yeah, check us out on Patreon. And, uh, and uh, we really appreciate all of the support. Okay, well, now it's not too early to say that it's time for <laughs> Tool of the Show. Tool of the Show! My Tool of the Show is VCPKG, or, or I don't what? know what that's supposed to uh, actually be. Let me see. Yeah, it's VCPKG. It's a, it's a song from Microsoft. It's a, uh, it's a C++ library manager. Um, it works really well. So basically, um, if, if you program in, let's say, JavaScript or TypeScript, then you, you're definitely familiar with NPM um, or Yarn. And so these are package managers. You can basically say, you know, NPM install um, React. And it will just go through, install React, install all the dependencies. It just, it'll, it'll do all the work for you so that in your code, you can just type, you know, import React and it's just done. You don't have to worry about, um, you know, what it took to make that happen. Um, you know, for for Java, there was Maven, uh, which did this. Um, for Python, there's Anaconda or Pip. Um, but for C++, you know, there's been a variety of different tools. And, and I did a quick survey myself. There was, I think, one called Conan. Um, there was one, actually, that Ethereum uses. Um, I don't remember the name of it. But, um, but VCPKG from Microsoft seemed to be the best. And it worked really well. Um, it's it's even though it's from Microsoft, it's you don't have to be on Windows to use it. Um, but basically, you install you install this program, and then it's just VCPKG VCPKG install whatever the C++ library is. It could be Boost, it could be Protobuf, it could be you know SDL, uh, whatever you need. Um, after you do that, um, then uh, if you you have to be using CMake for this to work. Um, but then in, in your CMake file for your project, um, you pass in this VCPKG toolchain file and, uh, and, then, and then you're good to go. So you could just, you know, bang include uh, boost and it's, and it's there. Um, so, so I thought it, was, it worked pretty well. I mean, with C++, it's difficult because it's much more open-ended in terms of the build system and everything. Um, but, but this struck a good compromise where it, it, it forces you to use CMake, but um, that is, it's not holding your hand too much there. And on the flip side, it has a lot of packages and really good support. Yeah, this is pretty cool. I, I'm gonna check it out. I always struggle with C++ and getting libraries and dependencies. And do you include the source in your source? Do you have everyone build their own libraries? Oh, it's always such a mess. Yep, yep. Yeah, I mean, I try to, uh, include the source in the source. So if you look at eternal terminal, um, there's an or or any of the projects I have, there's an external folder, and there's a bunch of Git submodules in there. Um, but for some things like Protobuf, it's just not practical. Um, and so and so I relied on this, and it, it so far it's worked pretty well. Well, keeping with not recommending informational books or tools, uh, I'm recommending a game. <laughs> That game, that game is Dead Cells. Uh, I guess most people probably heard about it, but I'm I'm late to it. Uh, this is a rogue light Castlevania-inspired action platformer. Okay, I cheated. I read from their website because wow. I didn't know how All to right. describe it. So if you've ever played a Castlevania game and sort of doing the 2D platforming and uh, also having things closed off that you don't know how to get to yet, yeah, this has kind of those elements. It also has roguelike elements that, you know, you make some amount of progress, but also, like, if you die, you, you kind of lose some of the stuff. And uh, I really find it pretty cool. And I first uh, started playing it, although it had been out for a while on other platforms, on, the, um, on my iPad. And there it's a little tough because some parts require kind of a lot of precision. 
Um, but I still thoroughly enjoyed it. The art style is pretty cool. The the kind of atmosphere of the game is really nice. And the awesome thing is it's available um, on, you know, I think like the Xbox, PlayStation, the Switch. I know it's on iOS. Um, it didn't look like it's on Android yet, but uh, most people probably have at least one of many of those things. Uh, on the PC as well, I believe it's on Steam. Um, and so if you haven't checked it out before and that description sounded interesting or you go look it up and see the video. It sounds interesting uh, and check it out. But I really like that game. It's really cool. I definitely have not, I, so I have not won or made tons of progress, but I do keep playing it. Cool. So it's it's uh, it's a Castlevania game, so you're kind of running around like slashing at things? Yeah, that's right. Yep. And you have various weapons. You can switch out or change or customize your person, and you kind of unlock better stuff as you make progress, kind of like a rogue. Oh, okay. Cool, I'll check it out. There was one called uh, Wayward Souls, which was like a, um, it sounds similar, but uh, um, one thing I didn't like about that game is it was, you remember those, uh, remember like, uh, you know, like the original Zelda, how it was kind of yes. like a top down, but not really. It's also kind of from the side too, right? Isometric? Um, is it, I think it's isometric. Is it isometric? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, so, so this, the Wayward Souls was isometric. And so that made it kind of difficult to judge the distances. So it sounds like the Dead Cells is, uh, is like a platformer, like a side view. It's like a like side. That. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, it might be easier. Um, cool. Yeah, I'll check that out. I'll probably pick that up. I'm a huge, huge gamer. So I'm actually surprised um, I'd heard of that. So I'm going to oh, really? go grab it. Okay. It's, on, it's on mobile, you said? Uh, I don't know if it's on Android. I looked. I couldn't. It didn't look like it was, but it's on nearly everything else. So I actually don't know why it's not on Android. Oh, okay, got it. Got it. So since you already just said you have a, a pixel, you might be uh, you might be left out. Oh, it says yeah. it's coming on June third. Says Android oh, okay. on June. 3rd. All right. So. Cool. Maybe I'll pick it up on PC. So for our for our topic, we decided to do something a little bit different. So I had this idea, and then I kind of looked, and I became enamored with it. So if everyone hates it, you can send your hate mail to uh, Jason. <laughs> Um, <laughs> people say they can't tell our voices apart so they don't know who's talking anyways <laughs> um so i i thought you know we did 100 episodes i, I didn't want to do something super celebratory or patting ourselves on the back because just because we're dumb enough not to quit doesn't mean that uh we've done something great but what i did say <laughs> is it, it's been nine so our first episode was in 2011 and people throughout the years have written us and told us how funny it is to go back and listen to um early topics but I wanted to take uh, some of the show notes that we had from our early episodes. I don't know how many we're going to do. We'll just sort of see. And uh, and we'll sort of take turns or do it together and, and just sort of read through some of the topics and talk about how times have changed or how things have changed. And, uh, you know, just sort of a little bit of a look back uh, and funny because, you know, we're talking at the beginning, even, you know, video conferencing and how it just takes time for a culture to, to sort of grow up around it. Um, and so I, I'm pretty sure we'll find some uh, some insights here about what things have or haven't changed. Maybe some languages have gone and maybe some languages, <clears throat> see, are never going to go away. Um, but uh, <laughs> we're going to take it away. So so I'm going to take it with the very first one, Jason. I'm taking it all the way back to February of 2011. Oh, sorry, Dude, March of thing, 2011. What, oh, sorry, you're going to say tell people. One thing you tell people is, is, is Patrick's agreed to do the odd episodes and I've agreed to do the even. And we've also agreed not to read you know, the other one. So this oh, is going to yeah, be yeah. a surprise to me, and, and mine are going to be pretty surprising to Patrick, too. Yeah. Okay. So so episode one. So here it goes. So the first thing that I have in the show notes that we talked about was the fail overflow PS3 hack, which we warned people not to watch the video that we posted a link to because we didn't want someone to get into trouble for uh, oh, all the things yeah. that happened. Oh, man. I remember that. So Do you know, actually, my, uh, because of that, oh, no, no, never mind. There was actually a, an unrelated hack and a bunch of remember when when the PlayStation was the store was hacked and all of our credit cards got leaked out. Oh, yes. yes but I think yes. this is different. This is hacking the actual hardware. So the next one is going to be uh, we know it's there, but it's coming. So this was we talked about Bitcoin. Yes, we talked about Bitcoin in March of <laughs> yeah. 2011. And yes, if we had bought a hundred dollars of it, even today, I think we would still have millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, so Bitcoin, Jason, has, what do you think about Bitcoin? Do you think it's got a future? No, it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. I think what we should do is we should take the Bitcoin that we mined um, on our university computer and software. 
take all those coins and sell them for six dollars a piece that's what we should do <laughs> yeah what would you say what would you say if i would sell you some bitcoins for like 10 cents yeah that'd be awesome yeah i'll take it how, how many would you like to buy <laughs> uh oh, so we talked about the bitcoin java client and what bitcoin was oh man then we talked about uh, comics, C O M I X, which I believe is a, 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 a like an oh, e comic. Yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah. man. Wow, that's wild. That was before. That was before like Comicsology and Amazon having like Kindle comics, which is how yeah. how I view myself today. That was before you had all that subscription stuff. So that's changed a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a whole and, and Marvel so movies different. and yeah. Yeah, the way comics work today and, and how they're in mainstream culture is super different. So this is a, this is a good one. Episode two, uh, um, well, there was, a, there was a TED Talk for a guy who, who tells some pretty funny jokes using math. But I actually really like this. Uh, we had a video making fun of, of Hillary Clinton not knowing what Firefox was. And uh, <laughs> so, spoiler alert, Patrick and Jason know who wins every election. We could just call it right here. <laughs> Uh, that was uh in march 25th 2011 um man that's hilarious so on the news you know ios uh four <laughs> was on the news and uh um and uh yeah apple 2 emulator it's pretty cool yeah this is a, a wild throwback so what so is there anything uh anything interesting in some of the uh some of the, some of the episode three stuff yeah so here so i'm looking at episode three now and I mean, so I see that the tool of the day for me was KeePass. So apparently I used to actually give useful tools of the day, not games. <laughs> um, and I still use KeePass. Uh, and so I'll use this for a second yeah, as a little a little different. But someone was asking me, uh, someone recently had a death in their family. Um, and they were sort of saying, you know, how do you make sure that like other people would be able to access it? And, and I have a great story for like, if both my wife and I passed away. But I was like, you know, basically for my wife and I, you know, we keep all of our, our passwords in a key pass save that we have sort of backed up and synced really well so that if something happened to me, she could get into all my accounts. And then we have a very long, unique password with strong instructions to never use that password anywhere else uh, for that key pass save. Um, and I felt pretty good about that. Um, and so yeah. that's sort of my strategy. But apparently I must have started, I've been using key pass for nine years. So since April of 2011. And you use yeah. it too? Yeah, yeah. I've been using it since we since we found it and that show. Which is which is totally bonkers. Nice. So that that's a product that uh, is really solid. So here's a, here's another here's a good uh, news article. Google hires the inventor of Java to work on Android. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Um, so this is yeah. James Gosling that, that was talked about. Yeah, that's right. You know, so I have a funny story actually. So I I um I ended up meeting James Gosling, and uh, um he gave a presentation. Um, and and uh, he, he came to the presentation with a shirt um, that said, uh, um, well, it, it said F word PowerPoint. <laughs> so the, the shirt just said that. And like, I think he, he must have made it himself because it, it just was like an Arial, like whatever the default font is that comes with MS Paint. It, you know, he just got that and then went to a T-shirt transfer company or something. It just said F PowerPoint. And then and then he 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 just gave a whole presentation um, with, with with no screen at all, like he just talked. Um, and I thought that was hilarious. And then I think about six months after he joined Google, he quit. And um, and uh, he went to work on some robotics thing. But who knows yeah, I don't know how long he was there for. But yeah, he's not at Google anymore. I don't think. I think he's moved on. Yeah. All right. Uh, in, in episode eight, what we about talked episode? To Oh, I was going to jump to eight. We talked about uh, yeah, yeah, the developer, fine. developer versus programmer versus computer scientist, which I think that's a actually still today a pretty oh, relevant thing. Um, that you know, it's it's actually surprising that you know almost a decade later we haven't uh, um, we still just call everyone software engineer. Although now there's machine learning engineer, so at least there's like I guess some uh, type of distinction. Okay. Yeah, so I see in here the in episode oh where was it? Uh, in episode five, I was gonna say that uh, that was the first time we, apparently we thought it was newsworthy that iOS would allow you to do updates over the air. You wouldn't have to plug oh. into your computer to update your phone. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Oh so, my gosh. So that so that's good. that's pretty good. Oh man, things were so different. I don't even know that I had a smartphone at that time. 
Oh, okay. In in episode ten, um, Minecraft was still owned by Notch, oh. and uh, and and uh, someone um, someone was claiming uh, Bethesda actually. Wow, I didn't even I totally forgot about this. So Bethesda, I guess, um, had a game, and the mine the, the Notch was making another game, and they had the same name, and and Bethesda said they were gonna sue. And Notch said he'll play their best player in Quake 3. And if Notch wins, he gets the name. And if the Bethesda employee wins, then Bethesda gets the name. <laughs> that game never came out, though, right? No. Yeah, yeah. He did make another game called Fun with Blocks, which um, uh, which I bought foolishly, thinking that you know any game Notch makes would be amazing. And it was it was actually terrible, to be honest. But. Uh, Wow, I can't believe this is this long ago. So moving into 2012, episode 15, we covered that uh, Facebook was going to IPO. Oh, my gosh. Oh, no, I guess that they did IPO, but they IPO'd and they went down. And we were saying how it was like, I guess, a little bit of schadenfreude probably at the time. But people were covering that they were blaming that they went down 11 percent right after they IPO'd in in 2012. I'm pretty sure... I would take it at the IPO price now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the IPO price was uh was like fifteen dollars and it went to twelve or something. Yeah, I would definitely yeah. take that. Oh man. Yeah, it's crazy perspective, man. So yeah, uh yeah. It's it, that, in, I, but I remember that it doesn't feel that long ago. Yeah. In episode twelve we introduced the Raspberry Pi. Oh, and I don't think crazy. it had come out much before that. I mean Raspberry Pi is like yeah, Raspberry Pi, and even uh, people largely have been, well, no, I guess that's not true. Arduino and Raspberry Pi, I guess, are just such staples now. Like, yep. it's, it's yep. kind of hard to imagine what it would be like without those. Yep. Uh, in episode 14, we announced the Pebble, and uh, uh, they're out uh, of business. <laughs> they got so, acquired, right? Didn't Intel buy them, or no? Well, kind of. I mean, they basically went out of business. I mean, they were acquired, but it was not a good price if i remember correctly yeah okay so episode 17 or in august of 2012 and we talked about the uh gangbuster selling of the ouya video oh my game gosh i remember that the, oh man the i remember Ouya. looking at that and being like that is amazing it's exactly the console i want it plays all these awesome android games and then uh yeah like six months later it was gone right it's wild yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I don't think uh, they, yeah, they raised eight points. I'm clicked on the Kickstarter page now. They raised eight point six million dollars. I don't think anyone probably plays Ouya today, right? Uh, maybe yeah. someone does. There's no way. I mean, I would say even stronger than that. I don't think anyone played Ouya a year after they got it. <laughs> oh, oh man! man. It, in, in episode it, 16, we announced the very first Microsoft Surface. <laughs> oh wow. Do you remember Surface used to be like a tabletop like presentation thing oh, yeah. for companies? And then they just like decided the name was too good to use on that. And so they decided to use it for tablets. Yeah, I remember that. Actually, I remember watching a video of people playing D&D on that, on that huge, Ooh. Uh, that huge screen that was horizontal like that. And it looked amazing. Wait, were they in the same room though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a bunch of people in the same <gasps> room playing no! on a surface and they had they had their own like 3d models that they had printed and put on top of the table it looked amazing oh that's cool yeah uh yeah here we go the wii u is getting ready to come out man it's 2012 <laughs> do you think that's gonna be a success i don't oh, know here's something, here's something that will never work uh in 2012 apple buys fingerprint scanning company <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> oh man i cannot believe we've been doing this this long they don't even do fingerprints anymore yeah right? it's, everything's all face going. id now so yeah oh, that's gosh. crazy so we were there long enough to they acquired a company delivered a product changed everything and then deprecated it yep uh yeah wow history moves a lot faster than you think yeah that's nuts oh man all right it's i don't funny. know anymore. I that, i'm these... not sure how... I can look at these and I know immediately who found this. Like wooden computer kit. This definitely came from Patrick <laughs> in episode uh, 22. That is absolutely true. That is absolutely true. Uh, yeah, that's true. The, the news articles definitely have a, a fingerprint on them. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I And I remember talking about this stuff. I can't believe. Well, whatever. Anyways, I can't believe this is seven years ago. 
in January of 2013. I remember talking about the Bigelow inflatable space station modules that they were going to send up to the ISS. They ended up sending some up and testing it. But I, I mean, I don't think anything's come of it. I don't hear about it anymore. Yeah. Wow. Episode 32, how to start a machine learning startup. Uh, was back <laughs> in 2014. Yeah. So many of my friends uh, around this time left to start machine learning companies. And uh, um, well, it depends on your... It, it depends on your definition of failure. <laughs> I mean, so, so you know, if the company gets acquired um, and and uh, you get paid basically what you would have made if you had just kept your regular job, like you could consider that a success in a sense because like you got to start a company and, it, you know, but if, if you would, if, if you define success as like now you have a business that's self-sustaining, every single machine learning startup that I know failed. Um, which is, I think at the end of the day, machine learning is, uh, like a good tool to make something better. And, and that thing that you made better should be the company, you know, like, like, like you could argue like Google, you know, has a better search engine because of machine learning and, or maybe statistics, whatever you want to say. And, and, uh, but at the end of the day, they weren't like a, a, a statistics company, they built the search engine. And so all the people who set yeah. out to say, like, you know, we're going to do deep learning and charge people for it, uh, that, that didn't really work out. Yeah, I'll do a couple more. So in September of 2013, episode 29, we had an article that Nissan was going to have self-driving by 2020. Oh, man. Nissan would have self-driving. Uh, they, got, dude, they got eight months. They have eight months <laughs> left. <laughs> Still holding out. I think, uh, <sighs> uh, you know, I think, well, you know, here's the thing. If they if they do so, not Nissan, they're out. But if they, in general, if anyone does self-driving highway, um, which I think Tesla already has, right? Then, Depending uh, on your definition. Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I think if if you could go rest stop to rest stop without touching the steering wheel, that's my definition. Oh, so you're so you're trying to say that we should take show notes for predictions for our 200th episode? Is that what I hear you saying? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Oh my gosh, can you imagine 20, what the world's going to look like? 2029? Wow, it'll be nuts. Oh, so. episode 36, Twitch bought by Amazon, September oh. 8th, 2014. That was six years ago. Wow, that's great. It feels much more recent. Here's the Lytro camera. That's another thing that got pretty big and then died. Oh, yeah. Yep. 2014, episode 33. Oh, man. Looking at these languages, though, I must say the languages we covered are all pretty robust. It's like we... Yeah. You know, one of the things that I'm seeing is I had a lot of I had a lot of views on on machine learning and statistics stuff. And um, one of the things that's that that this is like a lesson for a lot of people is like there's things that now like are we have an unconscious understanding for that in 2014 and, and definitely in 2011, we, had, we, we it was really a struggle to understand. Like uh, I have this Markov chains for simulation. And I remember at the time, that was a really hard thing to understand. Um, but now I've been using them so much that it's just like a second nature. Yeah, that's right. It, it, it's easy to forget how little we knew. That. Like, yeah. You, you, yeah, you get used to what you know now and you feel like you've always known it. Yeah. Oh, there's a um, episode. Wow. Wait a minute. Is that right? So Windows 10 came out in 2015. Windows 10 is five years old. That can't be right, really. <laughs> I mean, I've secretly been going back and editing all of our show notes to just be more hilarious. <laughs> oh, no, this is an article talking about Windows 10, which is going to come out in the future. But still, I mean, uh, okay. it's, it's like it's going to be about four years old. So, yeah, in episode four, yeah, so another, we're talking about Windows 10. So talking about all this stuff that changes. But, you know, looking back at this, like a lot of these tools, a lot of these things I still do and use. And like, like you point out, like wooden computers, there's still things I'm interested in or have hobbies for that that have persisted about like six, seven, eight, nine years. Like, I think I change a lot, but actually looking back, it's kind of like, huh, I, I'm not sure we really do change that much. Like you still yep. do the, the, you know, machine learning and I still have like embedded programming stuff. Like we, you might, things might change a lot, but actually they sort of stay the same. Yeah. It's like, it's like the, um, you sort of normalize the changes, right? So, so no matter how, how much things are changing, it kind of feels like a certain rate. And then you look back and you say, wow, it's actually not that. Apple yeah, also open that, source Swift. Did they ever do that? Uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that you happened. You can just, I don't know. Uh, 
Let me see. Apple Swift GitHub. Oh, yeah. So, so, there it is. Yeah. So, so this is pretty pertinent in episode 48. Do you want to know what my tool of the show was, Jason? Let's hear it. Wayward Souls. No way. Oh, my gosh. I actually, uh, um, I, I must have got that game because of you. And But then I don't remember it, and you say you loved it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, also, we talked a lot about source control, and there's a lot of what I would call a sort of roughly dead source control. I feel like it's all just Git and GitHub now. Like, I yeah, really don't so hear true. anyone talking about anything else. Yep. And that was just not clear in 2013 or 2014 based on what we we were talking about. Yeah. All right. Well, I made oh, it through in, episode 50, so. In episode 46, um, we talk about there's a there's a GitHub gist, like a little GitHub um, little snippet of code, which are things that you can put in, in a C++ file that will uh, not make the program crash, but will basically make the person's life really difficult. So... Um, oh. I still uh, talk about this today. <laughs> yeah. It, because of this article. Define if while. <laughs> yeah, so do things like put an if statement that every one in a hundred times uh, just evaluates true regardless. And oh, it just makes yeah. it super hard to debug. Yeah, that's right. Define if x to be if x and rand is less than 0.99. <laughs> Could you imagine? Oh my God! If if you did that, it would be just total chaos for whoever came after you, and it it it, it would be so hard to find. Yeah, All right, well, punishing. that's been pretty fun, uh, Jason. It's been nine years. Yeah, I don't know what the future holds, but uh, hopefully less latent video conferencing and uh, more awesome tech news. Yeah, I mean, well, we need to finish with a prediction. Uh, oh let no! Me see. Let me see. I'm gonna. This is I, tough. You know, I've been oh, making. For it. I've been making the prediction, but I'll make. Mine. I predict that uh, within nine years, that uh, well, this, I'm gonna. Uh, it's got to be bold. So within nine years, that I think that the way that high speed internet works is gonna be transformed by the satellite internet stuff. That there's gonna be so many extra satellites in orbit. Space is gonna change. I think the way that the world has changed is like how high speed internet works by getting it via satellites from one of the many companies trying it. Uh, the amount of rockets we're sending up. Um, I'm pretty bullish on space. I think people are going to be going into and out of space more than they do today. And I know people have predicted this for decades and decades, but I think the time is coming. I think there's going to be more travel to and from space. We've got SpaceX, Blue Origin, renewed interest in it. The Starlink stuff is happening. I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see a huge transformation in space. And I think, I don't know what the impact will be, but I think it'll be big. I think there'll be a lot of jobs around that industry. And I think it's going to change a lot of how stuff works. Wow, that's bold. That's bold. So, so you're thinking like no cable internet, like basically everything is wireless. Not everything, but I think like, yeah, you'll be able to just get high speed internet pretty, like, your laptop, for instance, like your laptop today basically gets Wi-Fi and not many people would pay to have their, you know, computer have a SIM card in it. I mean, maybe people do. I don't know. And have hotspots. I think that kind of thing will just become so cheap and ubiquitous that your laptop will, yeah, just use satellite for Internet everywhere. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. All right. My my prediction is that I think university education will massively, massively change. I think that people won't get loans anymore what will happen is there will be i mean there'll still be a loan but i think basically there'll be a contract where people will invest in college students and then oh. and then the college student will pay a certain portion of their salary back to give the return on investment instead of what we have now where it's a loan system so i think we'll I think all of secondary, is that right? Secondary, is that what you call college? Secondary education? Yes. Yeah, right. I think all of secondary education will move from a loan system to an investment system where people like literally invest in the future. Um, and I think that that is going to like radically change, um, you know, so many other things. I think that, that uh, you know, for one, like the immediate change is that like, like, degrees will have to become commercially like like worthwhile right um you know and i think it's going to cause like more regulation and more like the people who give out these investments will will um 
you know, they'll want to have some guarantees that they don't have now. Um, but yeah, I think secondary education will change enormously. I think that, you know, the, 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 the subjects that are not economically viable, I think that they'll, they'll find other ways to sort of teach people outside of like the university, um, like, or, or people will, will pay out of pocket, I guess. Um, but I think that, you know, if you look at, for example, STEM, um, I think that we'll have like all these, this, this sort of investment system set up where people say, you know, instead of you spending, you know, $120,000 on credit, um, you know, I'll pay for your college, but then I want, you know, I don't know, 130,000 or like, I want you know, 10% of your salary for the next 15 years. Or I don't know, whatever, however it works out. Um, and I think it'll move to that. And I think yeah. Yeah, that'll have a huge ramifications. Interesting. I, I think that's called, it's ISA, right? Income sharing agreement, having a personal ISA or whatever. Oh, I'd never heard of that. Yeah, I think that's the like finance industry term for it. Uh, income sharing agreement. All right, yeah. So I think college is going to go to at least not all majors. So it's already more formal. Majors. It's happening. Your, your <laughs> prediction is coming true. Done. Solved. Uh, but yeah, I think that will be the like the right. default way that folks folks do college at least for like some of these degrees that, that's also bold also bold i like it all right thanks everyone cool all right we'll catch you folks later next month we have um you know, we're going to talk about working from home and all of that um thank you so much for your support uh last month we did um you know we were really in the midst of you know quarantine um, so people don't know this, but, you know, Patrick and I live in the counties where, that were the first to get quarantined. So we've been in quarantine for a long time. Um, and uh, and so last month, you know, I just live streamed um, just myself writing some code. Um, and uh, it was really cool to, to kind of talk to folks and, and the whole live stream thing. If, if you like the live stream and the you know, being able to talk back and forth during the during the stream, let us know. You know, that's a format we don't typically do. Um, but if people have interest in that, um, let us know. But either way, thanks a lot for your support and uh, be safe out there. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.